And there's this common criticism that like, hey man, uh, the, 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 our eyeballs would not see that structure like that. It's fake. So, so let's, I want to take a moment to clear up any confusion about NASA images or images taken from telescopes or, or observatories. Most of the time it is rather accurate as in this is what your eyeball would see, especially if you see lots of blues and reds. Those are very common colors in the universe. So if you see blue and red, it's probably very eye accurate. Most likely the contrast has been enhanced. Uh, maybe certain regions have been brightened up. So, you know, it's been touched up like, you know, every single picture ever. So you can't, if you're going to say NASA, you're going to criticize NASA for enhancing photographs of stuff in space. Uh, NASA is like the last place you should level that criticism at. There's plenty of other things. If you've applied a filter on Instagram, then you are guilty of this too. All right. So look to yourself, pal, before criticizing NASA. All right. If there are other colors. Remember, the, the goal of these pictures is to do science. Yes, they also serve like incredibly useful PR, but we're taking pictures of stuff in space because we're trying to learn about it. And yes, sometimes colors are added, but colors are added for a very specific reason. We add those colors because we want to trace out certain elements or molecules. Like, let's say there's a bunch of oxygen in the structure, in the nebula we're, that we're trying to take a picture of, or the protoplanetary disk. We're looking for oxygen or carbon monoxide or something. Those elements will glow in a very specific color. Sometimes this color is can be seen by the human eye, sometimes it can't. And in the image, we'll let the computer paint those regions that it detects emitting that very specific wavelength of light, we'll let it paint it a different color so that we can see how it is in relation to all the other stuff that's going on in the nebula or the disk or the galaxy or the whatever. This is science. Like we're trying to figure out like, where's the oxygen in that galaxy? We want to map it out. We want to look at it with our eyeballs to figure it out. Assigning a color to an element is not a crazy thing to do. Our eyeballs do it all the time. You see green grass, you're picking out the element chlorophyll. You see the red side of a barn, you're picking out the iron in the paint. We're just doing it for stuff that the eye can't see. That's no big deal, all right? So sometimes we add the colors because we're trying to pull out more information because we want to get science done, all right? So it's your choice to appreciate that photograph or not. Would your eyeball see something exactly like that if you were to fly over to that nebula and stare at it? No. But if you were able to fly to any nebula you wanted anywhere in the galaxy, um, I think the last thing you'd be worrying about would be the photorealism of some stuff that NASA releases. All right, you've got, you've got other cool things to do, I imagine. I don't know. Hey, it's me again. I know you just watched a few minutes of me, but who can use a little bit more me? I'm just here to beg you to please subscribe. And if I remember, there's going to be a button like right here uh, where I'm vaguely gesturing so that you can click the button and subscribe and it's super handy. Uh, this is so that you can get the latest updates of all my shows. I mean, that's basically how it works. So if you like what you just saw, uh, you'll get more of it if you subscribe. Super easy. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Fukushima Daiichi has been in the news a lot lately. There's been tank leaks, contaminated groundwater, contaminated Pacific Ocean, and now Tokyo Electric is in the process of trying to remove the nuclear fuel from Daiichi Unit 4. All of these present enormous problems. So I thought I'd use the video today to take you on a guided tour of the site. We'll go up to the tank farm and check it out and then move down and look at each of the units individually because every one of them presents a challenge to Japan. I hope you enjoy the tour. In the center of this drawing is the 
Fukushima Daiichi 1 and Fukushima Daiichi 2 and then 3 and then 4. On the far side of this picture on the right are two more cubes and that's units 5 and 6. We'll talk about them later. As the numbers indicate, Fukushima Daiichi 1 was the first to be built. And all of the problems that are presently happening on that site, as well as all of the problems that happened with the tsunami, were created when they built Fukushima Daiichi 1. And they is not Tokyo Electric. They is an American company called General Electric and another American company called Ebasco. They're the ones that determined how close this power plant is to the water. Now we're gonna jump here to another slide of what Daiichi 1 looked like when, um, um, when it was built. And this is only Fukushima Daiichi 1. All of the issues on Daiichi 1 were locked into concrete, the, um, uh, what happened on units two, three, and four as well. Specifically the grade. If you look back up the road, you'll see a, um, about a hundred foot drop that engineers built a road down to the water. That was actually all dirt. This entire piece was dirt and those power plants weren't there. They were covered about a hundred feet of dirt over top of those power plants. So the decision to put Fukushima Daiichi near the water was made by General Electric and Ibasco. Now, of course that had effect on the tsunami and we won't talk about that today, but now it's a leading cause of the problem with the groundwater. The high area has a lot of groundwater in it and where is it going? Water flows downhill right into the basement of these power plants. So the decision to cut away the bank that was made in 1965 by General Electric in Abasco is the fundamental problem on this site because it's, um, it's causing the basements to flood. Back in the day, in the 60s, this, there was a large steep drop off to the ocean that was leveled by engineers. Okay, on the far side of this picture on the right is the tank farm. It wasn't there in, in 2011 and it grew dramatically from 2011 to 2012, 2012 to 13. And you can see it's getting pretty darn full they're gonna wind up having to take some of the land in the next farmer's fields over in order to uh, continue to store all this liquid radioactive material. Well, so the tank farm has grown dramatically and it's on the hill. Of course, the problem is because it's on the hill, the um, water flows down and if there's an earthquake, all of these pipes are held together with plastic piping, not much different than what you've got on a swimming pool. So the plastic pipe will, will, will um, snap and that water will just run right down that roadway directly into the ocean. The tank in question in this farm is leaking directly into the groundwater. But that's just one tank out of a thousand. And uh, while it's serious enough in itself, it's only problem number one. Problem one, the tank that's leaking. There are other tanks that are leaking too, but the worst one was the one that was identified about three weeks ago. Problem two is that this entire tank farm is not seismically qualified. All right, let's go down and take a look at the power plants along the water and we'll get to the problems three, four, five. Now remember, these power plants have basements that are essentially below sea level. And the water on the hill, that's just coming out of the hill as groundwater, had been coming out for 50, 60, a thousand years. When they built the power plants, they had sump pumps in the basement that pumped that water out so that the basements would stay dry. Well, now, of course, the basements are radioactive, so they can't pump it out. So we've got hot radioactive material in these basements, and uh, it's got no place to go except downhill into the Pacific Ocean. The problem number three is not the leaky tank farm. Problem number three is the leaky basements on Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, let's take a look at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. 
Now, it doesn't look like this right now. It's got a, a cocoon over top of it. And the cocoon is made of Kevlar, almost like the kind of uh, shrink wrap you'd put on a boat for the winter. This is, of course, uh, a result of the explosion. It was the smallest unit. It was under 500 megawatts, and it exploded first. So mystery number one here is just how much damage happened before the explosion. There's a lot of indications on, on Daiichi 1 that radiation was being released before the explosion and before the tsunami. So it appears that, at least for Daiichi Unit 1, that the earthquake caused some damage. Now in the foreground here is the, uh, is the stack, and Tokyo Electric found cracks in the stack at about 66 meters up. Uh, that's a, a likely a seismic node, and it's quite likely that that stack buckled from the earthquake. So there's a bunch of indications here that Fukushima Daiichi was in trouble from the earthquake, and the tsunami just sealed its fate. Let's move over to Unit 2. Unit 2 looks like it's in the, in the best condition, but it's, uh, it actually had a, probably the most severe containment explosion. Units 1 and 3 and 4 also exploded, but the explosions appear to be outside the containment explosion occurred inside the containment and uh, uh, at the bottom of the uh, reactor, below the grade of the reactor, there's likely a crack in the containment as a result. Now, luckily, the, the side panel of Unit 2 uh, blew out and hydrogen gas was able to escape as opposed to blowing up the box. But that box is not the containment. That box is something called a reactor building, and it's really no stronger than a tin shed you'd buy at Sears. It was designed to um, hold radioactivity in because fans were to pump gases out those tall stacks that you see on the left and right here. Of course, after the accident, the fans failed because they had no electricity. The hydrogen built up and, and blew the sides off of units one and three. Luckily, Unit 2, it had a blowout panel pop, and the hydrogen gases were able to, uh, to merge with the atmosphere. Unit 2 is a mess inside, but it sure looks okay from the outside. All right, let's go up to Unit 3. Unit 3, of course, is the reactor that had the worst explosion, something called a detonation shockwave compared to something called a deflagration shockwave. We talk about that on the site. Unit 1 had a deflagration shockwave, um, which was nowhere near as damaging. Well, Unit 3 is, um, is a structural mess. Now, it's, it's so badly damaged that they cannot move the nuclear fuel the way they traditionally had planned. The structure just won't handle the extra weight of a, of a, heavy, of a heavy crane put inside it. What they're doing right now on this plan is still removing rubble and by the way, those cranes that you see in the, in the movies are all being um, moved remotely. The operators are not inside those cranes uh, because the radiation exposures around these buildings are so high. Inside that building, uh, it's essentially a no man's land. It's inaccessible because radiation levels are so high. Well, what the heck happened in there is, uh, is another mystery. Uh, we, we know a detonation shockwave happened and... Um, no nuclear plant in the country can withstand a detonation shockwave. The NRC doesn't want to address that, so here in America we're, we've solved the problem of detonation shockwaves because we ignore the problem of detonation shockwaves. Uh, but we know, this picture is evidence, that it can happen. Inside that building um, is uh, extraordinary amounts of radiation, but also outside that building Fuel pellets were found in the uh, aftermath of the accident. Now, those were bulldozed under, um, but that's an indication of, of a major problem inside the fuel pool. You know, I, I've been saying all along that I think Unit 3 had something called a prompt moderated criticality in the fuel pool, and that particles of fuel would be found lying outside Unit 3 is an indication that that happened. If the fuel had come from inside the nuclear reactor, 
it would have had to go through the containment and um, uh, through a very circuitous path. So to my mind, it's very unlikely that uh, uh, that fuel would be found outside the reactor. We do know that very high sources were covered up with bulldozers early on after the accident and are likely still there. So what will they do with Unit 3? Uh, it has fuel in the fuel pool. Eventually, it's going to have to be emptied. But the radiation exposures are so high that, um, that personnel access is really, really limited. My biggest fear on Unit 3 is that the, um, another earthquake will happen. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Richter 9. It can be easily like, like the original one. It could be a, an 8-5 aftershock. But this building has been so damaged that, uh, uh, that it could topple. And, uh, and shatter from another significant earthquake. It's being covered up and probably will be completely covered with one of those uh, uh, shrink wrap covers by the winter. But right now it's the only building that's exposed to the atmosphere. Let's go down the road in between the power plants now to Daiichi 4. Now Daiichi 4 wasn't running when the, uh, when the accident happened, but yet it exploded as well. What made Daiichi 4 dangerous was the fact that all of the nuclear fuel wasn't in the containment. All of the nuclear fuel was in the fuel pool. So this, is the, uh, this was the biggest concern of all the experts uh, after the accident. And it's the reason that the, the uh, Americans evacuated out to 50 miles. So even though we had explosions in Unit 1 and Unit 2 and Unit 3, um, that was not the big threat to the population in Japan. There was Daiichi 4. Now, the reason for that is that the fuel was hot, physically hot. And if the fuel pool didn't get enough water, it would have drained. And then you would have had a meltdown inside the fuel pool. And there's nothing between the fuel pool and the sky to keep that radiation in. At least 1, 2, and 3 had containments that may have been leaking but they hadn't completely failed. So the main issue was, what if Unit 4 runs out of water? Well, you'll recall right after the accident, they brought in pumping trucks to pump water in. And even before that, they tried the helicopters, which was, uh, which was a joke. There was no way a helicopter was going to keep this thing full. Um, but in any event, they were able to pump the water back into that fuel pool. And now um, they got underneath the fuel pool and stabilized it. Uh, this is another indication of a seismic problem on the Daiichi site, because after the um, after this building exploded, Tokyo Electric went in and beefed up the floor under this fuel pool. So clearly they had concerns back in April and May, right after the accident, that this plant had a, had a fuel pool that it was in jeopardy of failing. Now, this one's all wrapped up in, um, in shrink wrap right now, and they're planning to begin to move nuclear fuel shortly. Now, nuclear fuel is like cigarettes in a pack of cigarettes. And um, if, if the pack is new, you can pull a cigarette out pretty easily. But if the pack is distorted and you pull too hard, you'll snap the cigarette. Same thing can happen inside this fuel pool. If you pull too hard on the nuclear fuel, you can snap the nuclear fuel because the rack has been distorted. The roof fell in on the building. Of course, the rack is distorted. So it wouldn't surprise me that in the course of emptying this fuel pool over the next year, they'll snap a fuel bundle. And you see the stack over there on the, uh, on the right? Well, that's connected now. So they'll pump the gases from inside that envelope up the stack and release them into the air. So it wouldn't surprise me that we'll get airborne uh, Krypton again, Krypton 85, as a result of um, cracked and damaged fuel inside that fuel pool. It happens at nuclear power plants around the country periodically. What normally happens is the fuel pool area is evacuated. All those gases get sucked out and pumped up the stack. So keep your eye on Unit 4. I suspect in the future that'll happen. Now we have to pray on Unit 3 and Unit 4 that there's no significant earthquake until those fuel pools are empty. Unit 4 is uh, structurally stronger than Unit 3, but still it's, uh, it's in jeopardy because it too had, um, had the effects of an explosion. There's also a bulge in that blue wall right at the bottom. Um, 
that blue wall is is concrete, and the above it was the um, what was the was the steel building that we talked about that you could buy at Sears. But that blue wall has a buckle in it, and it bows out about a, a an inch or two. That's something called a first mode oil or strut buckle, and it's an indication of a um, of a structural problem that they caused by the earthquake on Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4. So the buildings along the water, there's a long row of buildings along the water. Those are the turbine buildings. And um, while impressive, there's really not much going on inside them of a nuclear safety standpoint. They do have basements, however, that are flooded with radioactive waste. Out beyond those is, um, is rubble along the water line. And those are where the cooling pumps were that, um, uh, that all failed as a result of the tsunami. That's what was supposed to cool the diesels. And like I said before, if, um, even if the diesels had not been flooded, they would have failed anyway because they could not have been cooled because all of that rubble along the, um, along the coast. But what Tokyo Electric is now planning to do, because we've got radioactive basements being constantly flooded, with something like 400 tons of water every day, is they're going to build a trench all the way around Unit 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they're going to um, pump it full of um, very cold liquids through pipes and freeze it. And this is what's called the ice wall. So an ice wall will go on the, uh, on the land side of the, um, of the buildings that had exploded, and it'll turn the corner, and then it will go down the, uh, the water side of the turbine halls. And hopefully they're going to freeze more than a mile's worth of soil in the process. Now, there's no guarantees it'll work. It's never been tried before on such a large scale. And even if the wall works, there's no guarantee that it will seal with bedrock. So we still may have uh, leakage in the future with the ice wall. And oh, by the way, it's going to take at least two years before they build that ice wall, which means this thing is going to continue to leak into the Pacific for at least two years. Well, while we're on the subject of the ice wall, um, I want to talk about the, the book I wrote two years ago. This problem of radioactivity in the basements was foreseeable back then. And um, the plant manager at Daiichi saw that there was going to be a problem in April of uh, during the, uh, right after the accident occurred. So it didn't take a genius to figure out that these basements were going to flood. In the book I wrote, I talked about the need to build a zeolite trench on the high side of these buildings, on the land side of these buildings. And the reason I wanted that was to, not to keep the radioactive material from getting into the ocean, but to keep the clean water from getting into the power plant. Now you can think of these power plant basements as a, as a bathtub. And if, if, um, if you've got the spigot on and the drain closed, uh, what Tokyo Electric is trying to do is build the walls higher as this bathtub begins to fill. Well, my approach isn't to build the walls higher. My approach is to turn the spigot off. The trick here was not to try to prevent the water from getting into the ocean. The trick was to keep the clean water out. That's why the zeolite trench, if it had been built two years ago, would have allowed engineers to go up on the hill and pump clean water right out into the ocean. It would not have been contaminated because the zeolite trench would have prevented that from flowing out. Now it's too late. The groundwater is contaminated. And if you were to suck groundwater up now, you're not sucking clean water up. You're sucking contaminated water up. And uh, we'll see if it works. Last thing. I